are you doing today? I hope you are having a nice time staying at home. And I also want to believe that you are making very good use of your stay at home. My name is Angela Otabo, and I will be taking you basic technology today. We'll be looking at a very, very interesting topic today. And the topic is titled Identification of Wood. I'd like you to say that together with me. Identification of wood. Yes, wood, as we all know, is almost everywhere. It's in your parlor, it's in your restroom, it's in your kitchen, it's just everywhere. Do you know that wood is an engineering material just like rubber, plastic, ceramics, and metal? Wood is super strong, and you will not argue with me if I say that wood is one of the most versatile materials on planet Earth. Well, in order to help us understand this topic properly, we are going to be looking at it under three subheadings. What I mean is that at the end of this lesson, you should be able to define wood, describe the structure of wood, and also classify wood. Now let's go to the first subheading, definition of wood. Wood can be defined as a material obtained from the trunk and branches of trees. I have here with me a piece of wood that I actually got from the branch of a tree this morning. You may look at this piece, little piece of wood and underestimate it. Well, wood in its raw form may not look so good. But trust me, by the time this piece of wood has gone through a whole lot of processes, it's going to come out looking amazing. Well, God in his infinite wisdom and love created all things well, and he made them perfect. God created trees to meet our daily needs, and he didn't just stop there. He even gave you and me the wisdom to make so many things, to design so many things from this wood. Well, let's go to the next subheading. You will be looking at a picture on your screen right now, which shows you the structure of a tree. We're going to look at it step by step to help you understand it better. We we'll start from the outer parts of the structure. We have the dead back. When you and I look at a tree, what you see as a trunk is what is called the dead back. Now, when you peel off the dead back, what you see is what we call the live back. What did I say now? The live back. Very good. That shows that you are following. Now, after the live back, we have what we call the cambium layer. The cambium layer. Now, it is the cambium layer that helps the tree to grow wider and wider and wider. After the cambium layer, we have what we call the sap wood. The sap wood. The sap wood contains a lot of active living cells. The sap wood acts like a mother that nourishes her children. The sap wood transports minerals and salts all the way from the root system to all other parts of the tree. Now, after the sap wood, we have what we call the heart wood, the very heart of the tree, the heart wood. Just like you and me have our skeletal system to give us rigidity, strength, and support, so also the tree have the heart wood to give it 
rigidity, strength, and support. Now we move on to the pith. The pith is at the very center of the tree. The pith is a very moist and pulpy part of the tree. And if you look at this picture on your screen right now, you will notice there are lines radiating from the pith. These lines are what we call medullary rays. The lines are what we call medullary rays. Finally, every tree has its own age. And that's how we come about growth rings. Yes, growth rings can also be referred to as annual rings. Growth rings are also referred to as what? Annual rings. Very good. Now, the growth ring tells us how old a tree is. You may wonder, how can that be? Now, if you look at the structure you have, the picture you have on your screen right now, you see circles all around this picture. These circles are the rings. These circles are what? The rings. After the end of each year, you have a ring forming after the end of each year. So that helps us to tell the age of a tree. Let me see how well you have been following me. Let's look at the structure of a tree and try to outline the parts of the structure. So we can see wood structure basically consists of one, the dead bark, two, live bark, three, cambium layer, four, sap wood, five, heart wood, six, medullary rays, seven, growth rings or annual rings, eight, pith, and so on and so forth. I'm sure you followed me along on that. That was very good of you. Now, we come to the last subheading, which is classification of wood. This is very, very important because before you begin to cut down trees, you need to know what you want to use the wood for. And before you can cut down the tree, having in your mind what you need that tree, that tree the wood you get from the tree for, you must be able to ascertain what kind of a tree is this and what kind of a tree is this. This will help you to know which tree to cut for what purpose. As we move on, you will understand better. Now, wood is broadly classified into two. Number one, soft wood. Number one is what? Soft wood. And number two is hard wood. Number two is what again? Hard wood. Good students. Now, in order to help us understand better the classification of wood, we'll try to compare and contrast softwood and hardwood. We'll be looking at the leaf structure. We'll be looking at the shape of the tree. We'll be looking at the kind of climate they grow in, and so on and so forth. Now, let's look at the structure of their leaves. Softwood are trees that have needle-like leaves. As you can see the picture, needle-like leaves, thin or narrow leaves. On the other hand, hardwood trees have broad leaves. Hardwood trees have what? Broad leaves. So you can see they are like words and opposite, needle-like, narrow, and broad. Now, softwood trees also have pointed heads, pointed heads. While on the other hand, hardwood trees have bushy heads. Softwood trees have pointed heads and hardwood trees have what? Bushy heads. Once you can remember one, it helps you to remember the other as words and opposites. Now, softwood trees 
also give us wood that are lighter in color, in weight, and less durable. When you make items from soft wood, these items can last for decades. That's, well, a bit durable. But on the other hand, hardwood. Hardwood trees give us wood that are darker in color, heavier in weight, and much more durable. When you make items from hardwood trees, these items will go for more than decades and even hundreds of years. Archaeologists can attest to that. Now, we look at their ways of shedding their leaves. For softwood, they are evergreen. When you go to uh, a place where you can find soft wood trees, you notice one thing. The trees and their, and their leaves look green all the time, all year round. You only notice they grow taller and taller from year to year, but their leaves remain green. Permit me to say that softwood trees are not generous with their leaves. I guess they like to keep their leaves to them, to themselves. Well, on the other hand, hardwood trees are very generous. What I mean is that they shed their leaves. They let it go at least once in a year. And that is why they are called deciduous trees. Now, softwood also is very popular. It's less expensive and economical. And that's why it's very easy to see items made of softwood around us more than those made from hardwood. Softwood is more popular as timber, and because of its low cost, it is majorly used in the construction of windows, doors, pop. Have you heard of that word before? Pop. Pop is what we use to make paper, tissue paper, and all kinds of paper products. On the other hand, hardwood is much more expensive and it is primarily used, primarily used for high quality flooring, furniture, yes, furniture, like tables, chairs, cabinets, wardrobes, and so on and so forth. They are also used to make decks and so many other woodwork items that, are, that can serve a long term purpose. Examples of soft wood are fir. We have pine, cedar, spruce, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, the examples of hardwood are oak. I'm sure you've, you've heard of oak. What about mahogany? Now, I'm very sure you have heard of this one I'm about to say, Iroko. This is a very popular tree in our country, Nigeria, Iroko. We also have Obeche, Ebony, Tik, and so on and so forth. Now, softwood majorly can be found in temperate climate. Softwood trees can be found in temperate climates. When I say temperate climates, I mean cold environment, cold areas. For example, you have Europe, you have New Zealand, you have Japan, Canada, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, hardwood can be found in mostly tropical areas. And when I say tropical, I mean hot areas. Can you give me examples of hot areas, 
hot continent? Yes. Number one is Africa. Yes, do you know that apart from Africa, a part of North America is also hot and we can find hardwood trees there. Then also India and many others. But do you know that apart from the fact that hardwood can be found in hot areas, it can also be found in temperate climate, cold climates. So hardwood can be found in both tropical and temperate climates. So far, so good. I am sure you have been following me. In this lesson, we have been able to learn how to define wood, describe vividly the structure of a tree, and we have also been able to classify wood. And I want to believe that if I give you a test to write right now, you'll give me 100%. Is that right? Very good. So I'm going to give you an assignment right now. I want you to look around you for scraps of wood and design any one of these items. A ruler, a chopping board, a piggy bank. I'm sure you can do that. It's so nice having you here today. My name remains Angela Otsabo. I'll see you next time. You are welcome to the class. My name is Olawale at the BC. I'll be taking you physics. I'll be taking you physics. And we'll be looking at the topic motion. We'll be looking at the topic motion. I want you to look around where you are seated. I want you to look up. If you can see your ceiling fan, you see the blades moving. You can look around, maybe you are closer to the road. Do you see any vehicle moving? That is what today's uh, topic is all about. Motion is a change in position of a body with time, with respect to a reference point, with respect to somebody reading or observing that movement. I want to, for those of you that have baby of the house, crawling or jumping, running up and down, you see it's because you are seated observing that baby that makes you say, oh, why are you jumping up and down? Why are you running there? Why are you restless? Because you are able to judge from your reference point. Other example of motion that you can see around is the blades of your rotating fan. An aeroplane flying in the sky. A boy walking or running. So are good examples of um, motion. But our discussion will be based on the types of motion. We want to lay more emphasis on the types of motion. First, we look at random motion, followed by translational motion, rotational motion, as well as oscillatory motion. Random motion, translational motion, rotational motion, as well as oscillatory motion. First, what is random motion? It is the movement of a body in a zigzag or disorderly manner 
with no specific direction. Random motion is the movement of a body in a zigzag or disorderly manner with no specific direction. Take, for instance, the motion of smoke, smoke particles in the air. The motion of smoke particles in the air. Second, the motion of an ochre in the market. The motion of an ochre in the market. You want to help me to explain that? Yes, you remember, orange ochre, for instance, the motion and movement or its movement is determined by the, petrol, uh, by the uh, customers. First, at the entrance of the market gate, oh, our aim was to go straight to the tomato seller's stand. But on our way there, another customer beckoned on her from the right. After attending to that, from the left, left another customer, before going back to the main gates, the gate man says, oh, the orange is sweet because the way I see people patronizing this girl. Come, let me buy them before moving ahead. If you look at the picture on the screen there, you will discover that by the time you plot or you decide to draw the movement of that orange joker, it will look zigzag, zigzag. And so if you are working, maybe in the morning you are in the school, in the morning, from 8 a.m., at the gates of uh, GSS-1, you are there. Next, in the VP's office, you are there. The next, we see you at the talk shop. Next, you are at the main gates. Before you know it, at the end of your activities that day, if you are able to link them together and you decide to put your pencil on, decide to put your pencil on the paper to draw your movement, out that day, you discover that you have performed what the local people called aimless waka. The movement will be zigzag, no specific direction. Next, we'll be looking at translational motion. Translational motion. And this is the movement of a body in a straight line from point, say, P to another point, Q point P to another point Q. We said this trans translational movement is a kind of movement of a body in a straight line from point, say, P to point Q. Let's take, for instance, this car from this marker here to the laptop. The car will translate from here to here on a straight line. That is what we call translational motion. Your movement from the city room to the kitchen, translational motion. Your movement from the kitchen to the living room, translational motion. Another is the movement of train from station A to station B. The movement of train from station A to station B. Now. The third types of uh, motion is the one we call rotational or circular motion. Rotational or circular motion. Take a look at the bus, the toy car here. Take a look at this toy car. When you look at the, the tires, as you spin it, rotating about a fixed point, about an axis. That's rotational motion. I know you can say, oh, you have mentioned that before. The blades of a rotating fan. Blades of a rotating fan. Blades of a rotating fan is on the screen job. Now, can you please help me to add more? Oh, you remember your blender? Once you put it on, you see it's rotating. Good. Thank you. Next is the one we call oscillatory motion. Oscillatory motion. This is the movement of a body in a to and fro manner about a fixed point. It is the movement of a body in a to and fro manner about a fixed point. So when a body moves to and fro about a fixed point, we say the body is oscillating. 
the body is oscillating. A good example of that is a simple pendulum. A simple pendulum. A good example of a simple pendulum. The motion of a loaded test tube inside water is also a good example of oscillatory motion. But somebody may, you may want to ask, oscillatory motion is tossing a ball when you're on football field trying to practice. Is tossing a ball, is it not an example of to and fro? The ball, ball will go to your, your friend will return it back, then you continue kicking it. Or is the movement of Olawale on this, uh, on the stage not an oscillatory motion? The answer is no, because you can't determine the time to cover that to and fro. Since the ball is not attached to a fixed point, the emphasis in definition of oscillatory motion is that fixed point. Fixed point. The time to cover from, looking at the pendulum there, the time to move from a, point A to point O and then to point B must be the same. O to B, O to A, to and fro. So far we have discussed the motion as the change in position of, an, of a body with time, with reference to a point, a point. Then the types of motion. We talked about the random motion, which we call is the zigzag movement of a body with no specific direction. Example there, we mentioned uh, a hawker in the market. And I cited an example of an orange hawker. Now the second, we talk about the translational motion, where we make use of this toy car moving from this point to this point, translatory motion. We also mention the movement of a train from station A to station B, train from um, one town to another, translational. Your movement from your house to your school gates, translational motion. Also, we talk about rotational motion. Rotational, or the one we call circular motion. We say it's the movement of a body in a circular path about an axis. So a good example is that your fan that is blowing heavily. The rotation of the wheel. And finally, we talk about the oscillatory motion, which we call to and fro movement. To and fro movement. You remember? The first time you see that in the scripture was when God asked uh, Satan in the book of Job that, where have you been so far? He said, has been on to and fro movement on, of the heart. Now, look at this picture. I want you to look at it. Your guitar spring, your guitar spring is fixed at both ends. So each time you disturb that string, it will go to and fro to produce the rhythm that you want. Then moving this car from here to here is a linear motion, which is an example of a translational motion. Then oscillatory motion, as a sample there is a simple pendulum going to and fro. Next is circular motion. You can see it on the screen there. Rotational motion also, you see it there. Now, relative motion, relative motion. Relative motion is the motion of a body with respect to another. Relative motion is the motion of a body with respect to another. For instance, you are inside vehicle going to Lagos, and your friend is inside another vehicle coming from Lagos you will observe the coming vehicle as if the vehicle is faster than you. Let's assign the figure to the speed from Ibadan, Nigeria. You're on a speed of 80 kilometers per hour. And from Lagos, Nigeria, Speed of 50 kilometer per hour. 
This is your reference point. You are inside here from Ibadan to Lagos on a speed of 80 kilometers per hour. And your friend is inside there coming from Lagos on a speed of 50 kilometers per hour. What you will observe is the total speed of 130 kilometers per hour. As a matter of fact, if you are not careful, let's assume that it's uh, somebody that you love so much and you have his um, ESO or total handles with you. You would like to ping, you would like to call. That why is your driver fast uh, speeding this way on this, this road at this hour? What well, we are moving, if I, it's, you are the one that I've, I can even imagine that you are inside that vehicle with your daddy going to Lagos. It's because you are moving in opposite direction. Moving in opposite direction. But let's assume that you are moving in the same direction. Both of you are going to Lagos. You will be 30 kilometers ahead of your friend. 30 kilometers ahead of your friend. That means what you will observe will be 80 minus 50. 30 kilometers. And so that is the reason why when you are going, you just see, you hear a sound. Pew, pew. When vehicle pass by, you just hear, pew, pew. You'd be, imagine, are they going to heaven speeding this way? It's as a result of what we call relative motion. Relative motion. And I want you to look at these uh, class act activities. Let's do it together. Um, I want you to look at your table and tap any object that is there. Any object on your table, please tap it. Let me see. What did you observe? And what can you conclude from this? Don't look at my home. Tap that object. I'm not saying you should throw away the tablet on the table, please. Thank you. You discover that when you tap this, for example, or you decide to kick something from the, you tap something from the table, it will move. So it means that there is something called agent that causes motion. And so that will take me to this. I want you to design a toy such that can perform linear motion. You are sure that this toy can perform linear motion. Then you put the toy on the table and then tap it. So I want you to study the agent that causes motion and use it even while designing your toy. Put it in mind while designing your toy. Thank you. <laughs>